All right, well, we are continuing our way through uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, so we'll need our red hymnals uh, turned over to page 872 this evening. There you go. Uh, And at least the first scripture passage we're going to be looking at uh, is going to be Romans 8, uh, which will be on... Uh, page 944 in the Pew Bibles. So I'm going to ask you to please uh, stand if you're able and give your attention to the reading of God's Word from, from Romans 8, 12 through 25. This is the Word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul, starting in Romans 8, verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father! The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see... We wait for it with patience. Thus far, the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Uh, Our Father in heaven, we thank you that in Christ Jesus, we are your children. Help us know and experience that reality more tonight. Help us feel your loving arms around us and warm our hearts with your love that led you to adopt us. And let ourselves be transformed as we realize what it means to have you, Father, as our daddy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So um, in the musical Hamilton, uh, sort of in the very second song of the musical, Hamilton runs into Aaron Burr, uh, and they're talking, and Hamilton says, I want to do what you did, graduate in two, then join the revolution. So how'd you do it? How'd you graduate so fast? Right? Uh, Aaron Burr was able to graduate very quickly from college, and Burr answers, it was my parents' dying wish before they passed. And the light comes on for Hamilton You're an orphan. Of course, I'm an orphan. God, I wish there was a war. Then we could prove that we're worth more than anyone bargained for. And in that line, a subtle truth comes out. Hamilton's identity, at least in the context of the musical, don't don't hold me to historical accuracy here, okay? In the context of the musical, Hamilton's entire identity was in the way people perceived Hamilton. Him. It was in who he thought of himself uh, tied up in his parentage. And the entire musical is him trying to prove himself as more than the illegitimate child orphan that he had grown up as. Him trying to show that he was more than the, Ill- than the illegitimate child orphan he saw himself as. Now, I haven't finished Ron Chernow's book uh, upon which the musical was based to know whether or not that's how it really was, but I've worked with enough orphaned and adopted people to know that that musical rings true in an orphan's experience, right? Being orphaned affects people's identity deeply, 
And being adopted can literally change personalities. We know this to be true from twin studies that have been done. Identical twins adopted have two interesting characteristics. One is that they have certain things that are genetically tied in. That is, even though they grow up in different families, they'll be exactly the same. But there are also pronounced differences between them on the occasion that two identical twins get adopted by different families, or in particular, the few cases that are recorded, and there aren't many, but they're actually mostly from Russian orphanages, where one twin got adopted and one did not. Those that did not get adopted have severe problems that are rooted in how they see themselves. And those who did get adopted are, generally speaking, healthy. Right? Being adopted affects us. Uh, and I know how much our insecurities and our arrogances can be tied up in our identity that comes out of who we see as our daddy. That isn't necessarily how we'd put it, but that's actually the spiritual reality behind it. And I, I want to tell you tonight that we are all prone at times to act like orphans. I mean, how often... You don't have to answer me out loud, but be honest with yourself. How often do you just feel radically insecure? How often do you worry that things are spiraling out of control and you're afraid? You're afraid for the future. You're afraid for our nation. You're afraid for your grandchildren. You don't even know who's driving the bus anymore because you don't trust your daddy who's driving the bus. Who do you trust? And how often do you feel that you just don't live up to your own standard, or some standard that you think you're supposed to meet and you're afraid that people are going to reject you? How often do you hear a small condemning voice in the back of your head that says, it doesn't matter how much you act like you have it together, you'll never be good enough. How many of us have to put on bravado to act like we know we're okay? I'm, I'm a good person and let me tell you, what you ought to do to be as good as I am, but behind it there is deep insecurity that actually drives that need to act that way. Whether it's arrogance or insecurity, which I just bounced back and forth between, we are acting like orphans when we do things our own way, when we sin, and to some extent when our worries get the best of us. All of our sins and all of our problems, at least the way we see them, respond to them, and feel about them is a product of who we either consciously or unconsciously feel our Father is. Now, I, I know if you don't know this, uh, everyone should know this, uh, there is an outline for the sermon on the back of the bulletin, and I know it only has two points on it, but since we printed these, I added another point, so I'm sorry. Um, so our three points, not two points for this evening, are actually going to be abuse, adoption, and assets. And to be very specific, the abusive father, the adoptive father, and the assets of the father. First, the abusive father. Now that voice I was talking about, that, that insecurity and arrogance, are often the products of someone with an abusive father. Uh, and Jesus says something fairly offensive uh, about people that, uh, that have a different father than his father. He says that people that don't think of his God as their father, their father is the devil. In John 8, 44, you might remember Pastor Mike preaching about this, Jesus told the Jews that they didn't believe in him because their father was the devil. And the Apostle John uh, later applies that logic in his letter, 1 John, saying, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, if you're listening to that and you go, whoa, are any of us really born of God, if that's the standard? Uh, that's where we actually need a more robust 
understanding than just this one verse in the Bible. Uh, but first, let, let's just get our head around the fact that all of us fail this standard because all of us were born of Satan at one time. Right? Uh, some, in fact, sometimes his voice still gets in our heads, and he still can influence us and mess with us, even though we don't belong to him anymore as Christians. The apostle Peter talks about how Satan is the adversary and the roaring lion roaming around looking for someone to devour. And the word Satan itself means accuser, which really comes out in Revelation. And Paul in Ephesians 6 says we need to have the shield of faith to extinguish those flaming darts of the evil one. Right in there he's talking about this guilt crushing that Satan often brings at us along with temptation. And for those who have never put their faith in Jesus, they aren't just influenced at their worst the way Christians are. They are indeed children of the devil. Now, before you go tell someone they're a child of Satan, let's think about this for a second. Don't get me wrong. I did not say that people who don't know Jesus are Satanists. That would not be accurate. Uh, I said that their father is Satan. But I'm not dissing anyone. The fact is, if someone is not a Christian, they probably wouldn't know that Satan is their father because it's something they've been deceived into. That's why we don't bring people out of hell by sort of, Rah, Satan's your father. Jesus did that, but he had a specific context, okay? We're not Jesus in this story, um, right? But most people, they've been deceived, uh, and that's why Satan is their father. And if it weren't for the fact that God saved us and opened our eyes, all of us Christians would be just as blind, because we're actually no better, which is why Christians who understand the gospel are humble and never insulting of those who aren't Christians. Because those who are not Christians, those who don't know Jesus, are not stupid they are deceived, just as we were without the grace of God enlightening our minds. And we all need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. Don't ever think that you got it, because you, you're just a touch above those people. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. People who don't know Jesus, people who are unrepentant of sin, are unwittingly but nonetheless children of Satan. And they need to know that. And they need to know that because it will give them a chance to look at Satan and go, I don't want to be, I don't want you as my father. Because here's the thing. The Bible says that Satan is an abusive father. Satan is the source of much of our insecurity, our guilt and shame, the accusing voices. Now, we've talked in different sermons and different lectures about don't go looking for Satan under every bush, but this is our topic tonight, okay? Satan is the source of much of our insecurity, our guilt and shame. And he is the abusive father, constantly mocking, constantly accusing, constantly leading down wrong paths because he gets pleasure in hurting you. That's, that's what abusive fathers do. And again, I don't tell that to other than Christian friends to shame them. I tell it to them because they've got an abusive dad, and if you know anything about people who are being abused, they often don't know they're being abused. They need someone to come in from the outside and say, listen, that's abuse. You need to get away from that. Right? They need someone to actually speak into their lives and tell them, hey, this is not okay. And when we tell people that that Satan is their father, and they've got an abusive dad, we can also tell them, listen, you can abandon that abusive family and be adopted by a father, my father, who will never abuse you again, friend. If you come from an abusive family, this is going to make sense to you, right? Because I'm saying, 
heavenly DHS is here and caught Satan in the act of abusing you, and you can be emancipated from your abusive family in Jesus Christ. And you aren't then just take, put in foster care. You are immediately and eternally adopted into a family that will treat you the way a father should. That's escape from the abusive father. Now, I need to say one other thing about the abusive father. Many Christians who are no longer a part of that abusive family nonetheless act like orphans at times. Uh, If you look at that handout, if you didn't get the handout, there's a handout back there, and I want you to take this handout. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's only 25 people here, so I want you to take two copies. Now, let me tell you why. I want you to fill it out for yourself And then I want you to give the other one to someone that knows you and loves you and have them fill it out for you, about you. Just to see if there's some differences. It might be enlightening. Because often Christians act like orphans. And so this sheet is from Jack Miller. Uh, He was a PCA pastor up in Philadelphia. He came up with what's called the Sonship Curriculum. Uh, And he has really helped a lot of people realize that even though they might know the Lord, they're acting like orphans. And this sheet is sort of a a way to detect son behaviors and orphan behaviors. And, And I just want to tell you, there tend to be two types of orphans in particular. The self reliant orphan and the orphan waif. Now, Stick with me and don't get too offended because I'm going to confess my own sins in front of y'all. So first, hey, now that gets everyone's attention, right? He's going to do what? First, the self-reliant orphan. This orphan says, you know what? I've never really had anyone there for me. They might not actually say that, but that's sort of what's going on. I'm right, And so they tend to, to uh, say, well, I'm going to make things happen for myself. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to do things the way I think they ought to be done, and I don't care what I've been asked to do. I don't care that it might offend other people. And it doesn't matter how little uh, that it actually, you know, inconveniences me. It might not inconvenience me at all. I'm not going to do it just because I was asked, because it's going to be my way, because I'm right, and I want to make sure everyone around can tell that I'm right. I've seen this in so many Christians. It's, it's, it's an abomination. Self-reliant orphans come across as arrogant. They don't like being told what to do. They don't even like being asked to do something. And often they will go against what they're asked to do just to make the point that they're Christians and they have freedom. They're not one of these brainwashed sheeple. And that orphan needs to stop and look at who their dad is and realize how gracious he has been to them and begin to show grace to others instead of asserting their dominance over everyone else. They they need to stop being the bully in the orphanage because they're not in the orphanage anymore. They're the beloved child of the Father who will protect them, who already thinks the world of them, who isn't embarrassed of them, and who says, it's okay for you to look foolish in front of others because I love you. And then there's the orphan waif. And if you were offended just now, you need to repent of your sin. And then you just need to know, you know, go to Jesus, and here's my sins, okay? Because, frankly, to my ears, what I'm about to say sounds far worse than what I just said about you. Um, But I know this is my besetting sin. I tend to be the orphan waif, and maybe some of you are too. Woe is me. Things aren't going the way I want. No one loves me. I just want to be comfortable and happy. And if I'm not, it's because these people don't really love me. It's because God doesn't really love me. If only I were really loved, I'd get my way. Yes, that does go through my head. Do you still want me to be your pastor? I hope so. Um, The orphan needs to realize that they've been adopted by a king who is going to give them more than they could ever imagine. They will never truly want for anything, at least not eternally. And that knowledge should bolster us up to suffer in this life without whining about it. 
And we can know that because our big brother has sacrificed, because he already loved us, he sacrificed for us to have everything so the Father will take care of us forever, we can give up some comfort. We cannot get our own way. And we can serve others even when it costs us. Now, having told you about the abusive father and the orphans, we're finally going to get to the catechism. Let's talk about that adoptive father, shall we? Uh, If you'll grab your red hymnal, which is hopefully already turned to page 872, uh, let's do the uh, question and response from question 34. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. That's right. Adoption is a central truth of the gospel. Now, what's sort of interesting about that is adoption is only mentioned sort of by name in maybe four or five passages, depending on how you do the counting, in the Bible. But there is a reason the Westminster Divines gave adoption its own question here and its own chapter in the Westminster Confession. Because adoption may only be directly mentioned, but it is a central aspect of salvation. In fact, salvation is a lot less glorious without the doctrine of adoption. J.I. Packer wrote, If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity... Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayer and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. John writes in John 1, All who did receive Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, you're an adopted child. God is your father. And I have spent this whole week agonizing. I think every one of you already knows that, which makes this the hardest sermon to preach. Because what I'm trying to do tonight is get you to feel something. So I have just sat around reading adoption stories all week, and I have not cried so much in a long time. So y'all better feel something, okay? I cried a lot for you. (laughs) Like, I was reading about these two boys who are in the Oklahoma adoption system. One's name is Martin, of all things, and the other one's Brian. One's nine, one's six. Uh, And, and, you know, it talks about how uh, Martin is this Uh, you know, got a big heart and just takes care of his little brother and about how the little brother has all these problems uh, because of being taken away from his mother so early and his mother was a drug addict, but they're such a wonderful pair of kids. And I was just like, oh, maybe I'll adopt them. Crap. Like, but that's us. We've been there. We've needed that. We needed someone to adopt us, and we got it. Now, friends, in the Roman world, adoption was normally done when a person did not have an heir, but wanted to keep things in the family. Uh, And so they tended to adopt, uh, you know, a nephew or a cousin, right? So this was generally wealthy people uh, legally adopting basically an adult, Uh, And it was often someone that was either had done good favors for them or that sort of thing. But that's not the aspect Paul is bringing out when he talks about adoption. When Paul writes uh, in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, He is mainly using that because of the concept of inheritance, right? What we receive because we are adopted sons. And he actually makes this way more explicit over in Ephesians 1, where Paul writes, uh, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
and in him we have obtained an inheritance a court uh, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory and, and of course that that's what we were reading about in Romans 8 right all this language about we are now heirs with Christ for we now have the spirit of God. We didn't receive the spirit of slavery, who doesn't get anything, to fall back into fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father! The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So it's this inheritance idea. It's get excited. Because do you know what you cut? Co- you got coming? I, I, I've, I've. All right, so this is a terrible example. When I was working in rehabs, right, I would have these guys that would have these huge inheritances coming, right? But they, you know, they had certain legal things they had to do. So they'd come into the rehab to kind of get clean for a few months, but then boom. They died, they got their inheritance, and they were gone. And the next time I saw them, they were trashed because they had spent all that money on drugs. But they were so excited when the person first died because they got all this money. Right? It it sounds terrible, but just think about, like, if someone really loves you and you know you've got something big coming. We need to get excited because we have the inheritance of God coming to us. Friends, if Jesus owns it, you own it. That's how adoption works. You are now, in some senses, in certain aspects, considered equal with Jesus. And if that bugs you, take it up with the Bible. Now, let me tell you something. Modern adoption, in many ways, is an even better picture of the gospel than Roman adoption was. You know, like I said, back then, adoption was beautiful because it was about the inheritance and this idea that we could get a good future and a grand future that someone else was giving us. But it was often sort of earned on merit. But modern adoption is truly something that is often a picture of the loving Father God of the universe picking those who have nothing to offer because God adopts crack babies, okay? Uh, I've talked with people who have adopted crack babies, uh, right? They're, they're children that are born to mothers who are addicted to crack cocaine. And, and these children are normally born in the worst of circumstances. They have intense problems. They have biological problems. They grow up with emotional problems because their brains, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't. Yeah, sorry, I just lost my word. They don't develop correctly. There we go. They don't develop correctly. Uh, And in fact, I was reading this one article about uh, how adoption is a lifelong commitment because once you adopt a child, you can never disown them. And so if you choose to adopt these crack babies, you got to deal with their problems for life. And it is a beautiful thing because when people adopt those children, they are adopting damage that is going to cost them their whole lives long. My friends, we are God's crack babies because we cost God his only begotten son on the cross one adopted person said we are all like crack babies born helpless in circumstances beyond our control and there's nothing redeeming about us but God's genuine love led them led him to sacrifice his son so that we might be made his sons and daughters And that needs to become more and more beautiful and believable to us because that is what will transform us. I I told this story recently, but I'm going to tell it again. There is a PCA ruling elder uh, who was adopted. And when he grew up in this orphanage, maybe you remember this. Good. I'll tell it to you again so you'll really remember it. Uh, He grew up in this orphanage uh, in foster care, and he kept going to family after family, and he'd get to these families but he was a bedwetter, and like an epic bedwetter. And so these foster families would get him, and he would go to sleep, and he would soak the bed, 
And the next morning, the parents would be like, oh, maybe you're not the right fit for us. Let's, let's go back to the foster agency, bud. And he went through family after family after family after family. And finally, one day, he gets taken to this family, and he'd, he'd finally had enough. So, you know, he gets into bed that night, and he goes to sleep, and he epically wets the bed. And so he gets up, and he puts on day clothes, even puts on his shoes. And he never unpacked his suitcase. So he rolls his suitcase to this, this couple's room, knocks on their door. The dad's, you know, groggy. What, what is it, son? Um, I, I wet the bed. Son, wh- why, why do you have your shoes on? Why, why are you dressed in day clothes? I mean, I figured you wanted to take me back like everyone else. And so the father got down on his knees and said, we are never taking you back. We adopted you. You belong to us. And, I mean, the way the story gets told by the person who told it to me, he immediately stopped wetting the bed. But at some point, he certainly did. But it was all tied up in the psychology of who he thought he was. And being adopted began to sanctify him. It changed his identity, and it changed who he was. And as we recognize the Father's love more and more, it changes us. And it gives us the assets of the Father. And now these are in a question we've been looking at each and every week. Uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism number 36, which I would also like to read and answer. Because I just want to end by showing how adoption works some of these benefits out. In fact, I want to say a lot more, but, you know, this sermon would be a three hours. So, uh, question number 36. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. Those, my friends, are the privileges, the assets, the inheritance, at least part of it in this life, of the sons of God. So there's almost a, a paradox here. Because in some ways, particularly the phrase peace of conscience, uh, is funny because Christians are still sinners. We've already talked about how we mess stuff up. Now, we're not sinners in God's eyes. We're not. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to the Christian, and our sins have been wiped away by his blood. So while it is true there is still sin that lives in us, in God's eyes, we are not sinners. Uh, And so, we don't have peace of conscience because we don't mess stuff up. We have peace of conscience because we know we're getting better and we have the freedom to keep trying because God is never going to condemn us or reject us. Because of adoption, no matter what a screw-up you are, you are always God's son. You might bug him, you might aggravate him, but dang it, he's always going to love you and he's not going to quit loving you. I think about the Isaiah 63 and 64 passage I had Peter read. Right? God's talking about, I am not happy with my people right now, and I'm going to do something about it. And, and, you know, that's straight out of Proverbs 3, uh, which gets quoted in Hebrews 12, which I have now lost my place for. Uh, Hebrews 12, which is quoting um, Proverbs 3, talking about, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Right? So God does, he does get bugged, and he does discipline us, but he never gives up on us. And so I've heard it this way. Religion is going, oh crud, 
I messed up. Dad is going to kill me. I've got to hide this. But the gospel, Christian salvation experienced is sinning, messing up and going, oh crud, I've messed up. I better call Dad. My Father in heaven, I have sinned before you and against you only have I sinned. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. You, you, you can't do anything to lose God's love. And he will, he assures you, he will bring it to completion. So much so that Paul wrote to the Philippians, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And knowing that should produce in us joy in the Holy Ghost and increase in grace. Uh, I, I think about how uh, there was this story of a little boy who got adopted, and he said, I want a lawnmower. Now, now, I'm talking like a little boy the size of those kids there in the back, like four-year-old. I want a lawnmower for Christmas. Well, he had in his mind that he could help his dad mow the lawn. Sorry, kids, you're not that strong. Not yet. You'll get there, okay? But this little guy wanted to help his dad mow the lawn. Now, in reality, he was totally unhelpful. He probably got in the way, if we're honest. But they got him a lawnmower, one of those little push lawnmowers, little the manual ones. And he helped his dad mow the lawn. And you know what? He may not have done a bit of good, but he brought his father joy because he was doing it out of love for the father who had adopted him. Right? It was joy in knowing that he had been adopted. It was the little boy having joy in knowing that he was loved. We are pleasing to the Father in Jesus Christ, no matter how little we actually contribute. We are pleasing to the Father, and that gives us confidence to keep striving for holiness, not out of insecurity and trying to earn it, but with a relaxed joy because we know the Father is pleased with us, and it's fun to make our daddy smile. And that also contributes to an increase in grace. Because when you know that's how God's going to treat you, it's going to lead you to treat others the same way. So here, here's a good orphan versus child question. Are you growing and being more gracious with people who are on the same page as you? Now, the best way to get this into your heart and is to spend more time with your dad and to grow more and more in knowing his love. And so you look at his love you see what his love cost for you. Not so you can feel bad about yourself that Jesus had to die for your sins and start to begrudgingly pay God back for what he did for you, but rather you see what he was willing to do for you, that he was glad to do it, and you go, wow, Lord, you're amazing. Jesus, you're amazing. That you would do this for me is amazing. I love you, Lord. Help me be better. Search my heart, right? Psalm 139, it was a part of our prayer. Search my heart and try me. <clears throat> Show me any grievous way in me. Because, Lord, you paid for me at the cost of your begotten son on the cross so I could be a son of God. And, and by the way, ladies, listen. You're daughters of the king. I, I, I've got a friend. His wife tells him every day, Zach, you're a son of the king. You go get him, tiger. So I'm here to tell all of you. You're sons and daughters of the king. You go get them, tiger. And ladies, the reason it's cool to be a son, we men have to be brides, okay? So you should get to be sons. Um, the reason it's cool to be a son is because in that Roman illustration, right, remember all the way back 2,000 years ago, Roman adoption, only sons could get the inheritance. That's why it's got to be sons in the context of the scripture. But, my friends, we are justified. Jesus paid for us on the cross so we could be adopted. Or as J.I. Packer put it, we are adopted through propitiation. You know, it often costs $10,000 or more to adopt a child today, but our, adop our adoption into the kingdom of God cost him his one and only begotten son, Jesus, who is destined to be our big brother and loved us so much and knew the Father's love for us so much that he was willing to pay that price for us. And he rose again from the dead so he can continue to be our big brother forever. 
And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, because in Christ we are adopted sons and daughters of the king. That's good news. You go get them, tiger. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Abba, Father, Daddy, thank you that we can call you Father. Your grace and mercy to us in Jesus Christ is more than we can comprehend. You are our Father, but the reality is still so far from our hearts. It's still more than our imaginations can take some time. So Holy Spirit, would you continue to give us increasing grace and more and more of a sense that we are adopted, cherished, and loved. And let that increase in us the hope of the inheritance we have in Christ and give us joy in pleasing you, our Father in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Friends, let's end our service by praising the Lord with uh, hymn number 305, Arise, My Soul, Arise. Hymn number 305, please stand and worship your Father in heaven. Whatever happens, may you cry to your father, Abba, Father, and he will answer you. Now receive your father's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.